Forest fires are a fact of life and part of the natural order, but the impact and the intensity of forest fires in the Western US and Canada have been increasing for decades. In this video, I'm gonna explain how we got here and why conditions today are ripe for one of the most dangerous fire seasons ever. Wildfires can be a natural occurrence and can provide all sorts of benefits to a healthy forest ecosystem, but they can also be very destructive and dangerous and have been occurring more and more frequently over the past decades. Here's a graph of some data from the National Interagency Fire Center showing the total number of forest acres burned from wildfires from 1983 to 2020. It's clear to see from this graph where this trend is going, but the question really is why? Well, to answer that, we need to go all the way back over 100 years to 1910. At that time, railroads crisscrossed the country and there were still millions of acres of virgin forest that hadn't yet been touched. Forest fires were common, many times being triggered by natural causes like lightning, but also by settlers and loggers. And while there had been some serious and intense fires over the years, nothing could compare to what happened in 1910 and what became known as the Big Bird. The exact cause of the fire is still unknown, but 1910 was the driest year in anyone's memory at the time. The mountain snows had melted early and there were no spring rains, and by June of that year, there were nearly 100 fires burning in a variety of places. Loggers and settlers likely caused some of those fires, but a much bigger contributor were the steam engines that ran throughout the forests of the west. As trains went along, they spewed out red hot cinders into the parched forest. In mid-July, there were a number of lightning storms that had caused more fires, and by August, there were an estimated 3,000 separate fires burning all over the West. And on the 20th of August, 1910, there came hurricane-force winds of more than 70 miles an hour that rolled in from Washington through Idaho and into Montana. In a matter of hours, fires became firestorms, and by the millions, trees were just sucked out of the ground, roots and all, to become flying blowtorches. Entire hillsides ignited in an instant, and wind-powered fireballs leaped canyons half a mile wide in one fluid motion. A forester who witnessed the big burn uh, talked of flames shooting hundreds of feet in the air. He said that they were fanned by a tornadic wind so violent that the flames flattened out ahead, swooping to the earth in great darting curves, a truly veritable red demon from hell. Now, when all was said and done, over 3 million acres were burned, most of them in just a matter of a few hours after those uh, hurricane force winds swept in. Seven towns were entirely destroyed and many others were severely damaged and 87 people were killed, most of whom were firefighters. Now, this all sounds horrific and, and I'm sure it was. And it really changed the way that forests were managed in the US for decades after that. The reason for that was that the Forest Service, which is only five years old at the time, had sent a number of its employees out to the fires to survey what was going on, to see what could be done to help. And three of those individuals later became leaders of the Forest Service. And what they witnessed at the Big Burn really left an indelible mark that, that changed the way that they ran the agency. One of those leaders was named Ferdinand Silcox. And when he led the Forest Service, he instituted a policy of total fire suppression where actions were taken to prevent forest fires altogether and any forest fires that occurred were put out almost immediately. He called it the 10 a.m. rule and it mandated that any fire spotted on a given day had to be controlled by 10 a.m. the following morning. Fire spotting towers were built all over the West and this policy of hypervigilance was very effective in preventing uh, devastating forest fires like the Big Burn for many decades. Starting in the 1960s, however, scientific research on forest fires increasingly showed the positive effects of fire on forest ecology. And in the 1970s, the 10 o'clock rule was changed to a let burn rule, which allowed naturally occurring fires to burn in designated wilderness areas. Prior to 1968, all lightning fires in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks were vigorously put out. Fuels began to build up to dangerous levels. If allowed to continue, such fuels would result in wildfires. However, a new program was begun in 1968. 
In areas where forest fuels have not accumulated in proportions which would endanger the forest and its wildlife, lightning fires were allowed to burn naturally. Now, allowing natural fires to burn benefits forests for many reasons. First, it consumes uh, low-growing underbrush and down trees that could build up and lead to much bigger fires in the future. It also destroys diseased trees and insects that feed on those trees and makes room for healthy trees to grow. Natural forest fires also add back nutrients to the soil and can even benefit uh, other wildlife. Some plant species also need the intense heat of forest fires to germinate seeds. Now, the let burn policy was in place for a number of years and it worked really well until something happened to change that in 1988. This is the 530 News. The word from the fire camp east of Cook City is all hell is breaking loose. The fire is also closing in on several park landmarks, including the Old Faithful Geyser and the Old Faithful Inn. And it still threatens two small towns on Yellowstone's northeastern border. Old Faithful in the park and the villages of Silvergate and Cook City on the northern border are feeling the heat from wind-driven fires that have consumed more than a million acres of the park so far. I've never seen fire activity like that before in my life. The uh, fire came down off the ridge and it was about uh, quarter of the way down or three quarters of the way down off the ridge. Flame links I estimate at uh, 200, 250 feet leaning back over the structures in the maintenance yard across the highway and it was very, very intense. Now 1988 was another very, very dry year and in June uh, there were a number of lightning strikes in Yellowstone National Park that caused a number of fires to burn. At first locals allowed those fires to burn because that was their policy at the time. Residents are praising the firefighters and condemning the policies that govern the firefights. The policy has also enraged members of Congress like Wyoming Senator Malcolm Wallop, who is furious over what has become the Yellowstone Holocaust. Let nature take its course has damn near destroyed nature. Wallop has demanded the resignation of National Park Superintendent William Penn Mott. But as things got more serious, uh, political pressures came in that ultimately forced their hand and a monumental effort was made to put out the fire. Roger, to be absolutely fair about it to the Park Service, however, while they didn't fight the fire earlier, they are doing almost everything that they can at this hour, I gather. They are doing everything humanly possible, but I'm afraid not enough human manpower can control these fires. They are too big and the wind is much too strong. President Reagan ordered a cabinet-level team to go to see if more federal help is needed to fight the Western fires. A White House spokesman says more U.S. military troops will probably be sent to the fire lines. The spokesman also says the White House has no plans to fire the Park Service director, William Mott. Some critics say that Mott should resign for allowing the fires to burn out of control. It was park policy not to interfere with natural fires, but that policy was reversed in July as the fires got out of hand. Mott says it was impossible to predict the flames would get so out of hand. In the end, nearly 250 individual fires burned almost 800,000 acres, which is around 30% of all of Yellowstone National Park. Even with the tireless efforts of firefighters at the time, the fires were only put out when an early snowstorm hit on September the 11th of 1988. Now this one event was as pivotal as the 1910 Big Burn, and the reason for that this time was that it got politicians involved. And there are a lot of angry people who believe that the National Park Service is responsible that it'll let the fires burn too freely for too long. And it really forced the Forest Service to change the let burn policy and um, fight more fires. And today, uh, fighting forest fires accounts for about 50% of the Forest Service's entire annual budget. So Forest Service policy today is kind of a hybrid between the let burn policy and the 10 a.m. rule in that today forest fires, natural fires, are sometimes allowed to burn where it's safe. But the, the problem is that now the Forest Service has to take into account the fact that urban areas are beginning to collide more and more with forests and wooded areas. And so that extreme fire suppression continues to take place throughout the country. This has led to a buildup of fuels in many areas, that underbrush and the downed logs, especially in the areas that are closest to homes and cabins. And that is one of the factors that has made some of the California fires of the past few years so devastating, like the Camp Fire in 2018 that destroyed over 18,000 structures and cost over $16 billion in damage. So another factor that could make forest fires uh, this year even more damaging is drought. 
Just like 1910 and 1988, we today are experiencing a severe drought in many places all over the West. Here is a map from the US Drought Monitor showing how severe the drought is across the American West. White indicates normal rainfall, but where the colors are darker, the drought is more intense. And there's a large swath of the country that is experiencing an exceptional drought. Numerous Western lakes and streams are lower than they've ever been before, and this creates extremely dangerous fire conditions. So in addition to the buildup of fuels, the close proximity of settlements, uh, to the forest and these extreme drought conditions, temperatures in the West have also been rising for decades and heat waves are becoming more and more common and more extreme. That extreme weather coupled with the drought has really weakened trees and made them more susceptible to diseases like the mountain pine beetle. Here's a map of the mountain pine beetle infestations across the Western US. It's become a huge problem and it's destroying entire forests. In many cases, these diseased trees can be cut down and milled and used for lumber, but most of the time they're left standing for years as tinder dry husks and fuel for the next raging fire. So how has this year's fire season been going so far? Well, according to the National Interagency Fire Center, there have been around 37,000 wildfires that have burned around 3.4 million acres, and we're now heading into the worst month for wildfires. If conditions stay dry, if winds pick up, if lightning strikes, then things could get bad really fast. So I know that this is all a bit of a bummer and I'm not trying to make a depressing video here, I, I promise. What I wanna highlight though is that we need to stay vigilant. If fireworks or shooting or campfires are banned where you are, follow the rules. There's a reason for that. If you want to have an explosive gender reveal party, do us all a favor and, and don't do that. Uh, if you live near a forest, take care to clear potential fire hazards from your home and protect yourself. Uh, lobby your local politicians to pay more attention to forest management and, and maybe above all, pray for rain. So if the fires do come, we should do what we can to limit the loss of life and property. But in some cases, the best thing to do may be to just let them burn. After the 1988 fires left burn scars all over Yellowstone, the forest came back healthier than ever. It took a few years, but it, it, it did, it came back, and fire can do that. It may be scary, but after some time, it makes forests healthier and stronger so that they can be enjoyed for leisure, recreation, and industry for generations to come. So again, I, I'm not trying to make a bummer of a video. I just want to highlight you know, some of the history of forest fires and um, you know, some of the way that we manage forest fires today and how it could be better. And if you like this video, be sure to uh, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel. If you have a comment, if you remember the Yellowstone fires, if you have witnessed a forest fire uh, or been a, 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 a wildland firefighter yourself, be sure to leave a comment and tell us about it. I'd love to hear your story and hear about what you've experienced. So again, thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next one.